Tenakuta Kato, and welcome to the Listen and Learn podcast. Uh, every week, we catch up with educators who are dedicated, committed to serving our young people from across Aotearoa. Um, I'm your host, Billy Revel, um, and today I'm joined by the wonderful people here before me, Sunho and Nisiola. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, and shout outs as well to um, our um, to Ako Matatupu, who's um, hosting this for us today. Uh, and also shout outs to um, Campfire Studios. Um, yeah, thank you so much for making the time to be with us um, today. And yeah, we'll start um, with you, Sunho. Um, kind of just give us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, so just about myself. I was born in Christchurch, raised there, um, Korean. And then in the past few years, have moved up to Auckland, was adopted by a Māori family, <laughs> and now I'm a teacher. Awesome. That's basically me. Um, kia ora, I'm Nisiola. A little bit about myself might be that I was, yeah, I was born in Waikato, uh, and we moved really quickly to Tonga. So my whanau go back to, I trace back to the islands of Tonga, specifically Wawa'u, where I got to spend most of my schooling years there. So most of my school experiences were in Tonga. And then in my senior years, I came back and moved to East Auckland where I carried out the rest of my high school and then went into university. And then um, since then, yeah, got into the teaching program and have stayed, stayed in Auckland. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, no. So um, <clears throat> for everyone kind of watching and stuff like that, um, you're both part of the C20 cohort? C21. C21, it was a test. And the name of your <laughs> cohort is? Te Ahi Te Ahi Tu. Nice, nice. What was the thing that kind of drew you to um, wanting to be a, be a teacher in the first place? Like, mm-hmm. It's funny because the the first character of my name, Son, means first, and it's the same character that goes in the word Son name, which means teacher in Korean. And so in a way, I was kind of doomed to be a teacher <laughs> because yes. my parents named me Son Ho. Um, but yeah, for a long time, yeah, I've just been helping people with math and sort of forming connections through that. But I always sort of pushed against the idea of being a math teacher, even though everyone tried to push me towards it. Yeah. And then there was a, just a couple moments where we spent like, I uh, spent some intense periods of time helping some kids prepare for their exams. And so then I just entertained the idea of teaching. Yeah. And I wasn't really sold on it until we actually did the summer intensive and yeah. I met everyone else because I was quite skeptical going in. But then after that point, I'd kind of been won over. Yeah. Then I actually went into my kura and then, yeah, got won over even more. Nice. So that's just like a real quick overview. Yeah, yeah. So doomed into teaching. Nice. Doomed into teaching. <laughs> what about you, Nisiola? Uh, <clears throat> so I remember when I was younger, I dreamed of being many different things. I think at one point I was like, oh, I should be a masseuse. I should be a hairdresser. I think I came across a whole bunch of different things. I do remember thinking teacher was one of them. I really looked up to my mother. She was my teacher for most of my um, younger years. And after that, going into high school, ended up not really studying anything to do with teaching, but finding out that it really did link. So went into doing engineering degree. And then afterwards, this whole time I had been doing stuff in my community and really started to sort of nurture a love for working with younger people, especially with children and then with youth and really noticing that, yeah, everyone does play a responsibility in terms of being part of education. And I was really curious to learn about how I could be part of that and be part of creating environments for education. And so both of my parents were actually teachers. My dad was a math teacher and my mom was a primary school teacher. And I wasn't thinking of doing teaching at all. I think I had like signed up. I was like, should I go into urban planning? Should I? I was looking for courses. And then someone was like, you know, just just go apply for, for this. Go apply for this. It was actually someone that had already done Akuma Tatipu. And they were like, you know, just try it out. Why not? So I tried it. I applied for it, went through the interviews. And then I think it was like, oh, yeah, the opportunity is available for you to take next year. And I almost wasn't going to do it. And I think I had to come into the office at one point and like sit down and like got a bit of encouragement, like just just have a go. It will link everything that you've learned. It will, you know, you will get to be with young people. You will get to continue having experiences. And I think, yeah, after the camp and everything and just being really aware of like, oh, 
the role that this plays in sort of the bigger picture um, was really fun to just explore and then to be part of weaving all the other stuff that I've I've wanted to do into teaching has been really awesome. So just continued from there. Yeah. yeah. No, <clears throat> it's cool. It kind of, like, it does sound sometimes, <laughs> even when we, we're speaking to other people as well, that, like, people are, are, are drag kicking and screaming into the profession <laughs> yeah. a little bit and onto the program. I guess, like, but I think it's, it's useful, <laughs> right? It's useful to explore because... Um, and through the program. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder sometimes, you know, how many people just haven't pressed that button on mm. the other side of it. You know I mean? Like, how many people have felt that urge or that... Um, yeah. That courts were and haven't. like haven't haven't backed themselves on it and things mm. like that and I think it's important to kind of hear like just give it a go maybe mm. um, like I don't like I, oh, I I don't think you're about to sit here and tell me that you've regretted many of it mm-hmm. um, but I guess like um, what it, what were the you talked about the specific parts of summer intensive and stuff like that kind of bringing you in. Like, what have been the most re- rewarding parts for you um, in your teaching journey so far? Because it hasn't been long, right? Yeah. You're one year out of the study part and first year, um, te- like, not training teachers, I guess. What has been your most rewarding part after the program? Mm. Mm. Um, I guess first to your point about people being dragged and, like, kicking and screaming, like, I think that's real true because... Like, there's a lot of talk about, like, the negative sides of teaching and the weaknesses and stuff like that, that I feel like often the positives don't really get amplified Mm -hmm. that much. And, yeah, that's what was quite strong in my head when Mm -hmm. I first became a teacher or when I was considering it. Because I literally have friends saying, like, oh, I don't want you to be wasted just rotting in front of a school of high school kids. Um But there's just a different reality when you're actually in front of a classroom. And so like you, I do wonder how many people there are who actually would love teaching and could make such valuable contributions, but yeah, just haven't been given the push yet or haven't had the opportunity to even be in a space like that before. Mm. Um, Yeah. Do you want to share what your most rewarding experience is? Yeah. I think even just on that note, I, Part of part of summer initiative was actually getting in front of a c- class, right? And it was teaching with, um, with the team. Like I remember, I was teaching with like two other people yeah. at, at one point. And I think a lot of those doubts, they they you get rid of a lot of them in those few weeks because I think part of it is like, okay, yeah, I had a, I might have had a really good experience at school, or, but you always have doubts about how you will be received. You know mm-hmm. how no matter how much you love and care for the work, how it will be received by others or how you will hold yourself in front of 20 or 30 kids. You know, yeah. you just you just don't know. And so until you take that step and realize like, yeah, actually, you know, this this effort right here and this little effort to do this and this little effort, it does make a difference and it is something um, that people appreciate or um, that you can, it's an environment where you can continue to challenge yourself and it not be, uh, too like risky or dangerous or yeah. whatever people mm. might assume. Um, that I think that was a really positive experience to be be able to teach together, get rid of some of those doubts, and then be just doing it regularly. That next year afterwards, putting yourself—it's almost like putting yourself on the stage, you know—and just like getting rid of that stage fright, almost yeah, 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 <laughs> kind yeah, yeah, of yeah. thing. Um, so you think that's like one of the p- parts of it is like. The thought of even just being in part of, in front of thirty odd yeah, students yeah, and, can and be not knowing, not knowing how it'll be received. Like you could love the topic, you could you could love working with with youth and, and young people, but you just have no idea how how it would actually be received. Especially when you're when you're dealing with topics like maths or sciences that usually have some form of like anxiety around them or some different things like this. You know, how do you keep people motivated and engaged? Um, yeah, having never tried that before is interesting. So. How, how has that engagement been with your? So you're both in the the maths department, right? Yeah, we're both. Oh, yes. I'm no, the, yeah. We were teaching. We were both teaching maths at Otahu. Yeah. And then I've gone into teaching STEAM at um STEAM and Science and Tamaki College. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you're Mix. at Tamaki this year. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm still just doing the math. 
fra The Maths. 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 There's been a bit of a push as well to kind of do the cross curricular stuff and yeah. things like that as well. Yeah. Have you found much space for that in your subjects? Um, not so much, just due to time. Yeah, like I think it takes time to make meaningful collaboration. Mm. But I have been having conversations with colleagues and just looking at how we can manage sort of the the overlap. In our work, so that we're not essentially teaching the same thing from scratch. Yeah. Mm. And so, one of my good friends at school, uh, Liam McKenzie, shout out Liam. Um, yeah. So he teaches physics, and I teach calculus. So then, a lot of the students that we get are exactly the same students, and there's like a sort of core base of math skills that they need for physics. And at the same time, we need good examples that can actually motivate them in calculus. And so, what we've thought about together is. How can we actually put that together and sort of align our timelines so that we're not just starting from scratch with the same kids because they hear the same thing from us. Yeah. So it makes sense that we should be communicating between us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like schools can kind of be that sometimes, right? Like different subjects and, and things kind of getting siloed in your, your subjects and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Rainbow Zen trip. That's pretty interesting. Mm. Rainbow Zen trip. Did you did you do a Rainbow Zen? They've never taken me to Rainbow Zen. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a I Rainbow Zen trip. I think they trip. do. Yes, the science department has. Just never been you, haven't, invited. you haven't had that chance. The no. calculus not not welcome Maybe at Rainbow Zen. Maybe you can go um, Butterfly Creek or something. <laughs> 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 to be fair, like when you, also when you say calculus, I'm just like yeah, 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 yeah. Like what, like. Is that like algebra and stuff like that? Is that all still in calculus? Yeah. I don't know. It's like, it's like building on it. So oh, algebra yeah. is like your box of tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a real shame that most people end math there because yeah. it's like, hey, we've got this box of tools, but we're never going to show you what we're going to use it yeah. for. It's like we just, we've just yeah. finished hammer theory, screwdriver theory, yeah. and all of this kind of stuff, but then you never actually put it together into like building yeah, a house. Yeah. Yeah. So basically at its heart, Calculus answers two questions. One is like, how do things change? And then uh, the second question is basically, if we do something for a long time, then what's the effect of that mm. overall? Yeah. And so the, those are the two questions that we typically ask. The first is usually called differentiation. Yeah. Second is usually called integration. We just use all of those tools that we've accumulated through yeah, school algebra and all of that kind of stuff, and then we actually use it. Which is really exciting. Oh, nice, nice. And it, I never got to calc at, at school, but um, maths, maths. I mean, it was always always fun. It's just sometimes at schools, I feel like, um, oh, when I was at school anyway, I didn't get, I didn't feel a push because, um, our class wasn't really engaged in maths that much at the lower levels, and so that calculus level kind of got missed a little bit. Mm. Do you find there's more young people kind of in your calc like is calculus just as popular as drama or dance or? Well, I'd suppose I'd say that we're we're approaching that point, and yeah. I think part of it is, and you can add to this if you have any thoughts, but mm. if you can make something interesting and a bit exciting and have a bit of personality, then I think a lot of our students just latch onto that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I don't even think it has to do with calculus purely by itself, but just by simply being a sort of positive face who's actually excited about the subject, that goes a long way into attracting people into your class. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'd say we'll soon overtake drama. <laughs> nice. Take slowly taking Drama teachers world. are pretty excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I've been trying. laughs> do you have any reflections on, oh, on that? I'm, do you do calculus as well? I mean, I when I was teaching at um, Otahu, I taught maths. Um, at that stage, I wasn't teaching the calculus um, classes. I was teaching the sort of junior years and NCA level one years. Um, what was the question that he was answering? <laughs> it's just... 
sort of like, uh, uh, do you find more students are uh, being drawn to those subjects and things like that in your uh, community? I think um, because it was compulsory, um, they just came, right? But I, I do know that, especially in those junior years, they were coming in with like a kind of like tenseness about it. Um, so I I don't think they were necessarily drawn um, to it in those junior years, but definitely like along the lines of what Sunho said, it, like as soon as you can like just be like, hey, like it's okay, <laughs> like we're here. And, you know, I love learning. You actually, I know you love learning too. Let's just do a little bit together yeah. and take some steps. Like it's all good. Like I think it's when the there's a bit of pressure on and it's like why aren't you getting this answer or stuff mm, like okay. that that it – that that you can see that, but I think within the first few weeks it wasn't like, yeah, within the first few weeks setting the tone of the environment, um, and and just you know trying to be real with them that like you know there's no need to feel that pressure. Let's just work through it together. Helped to get rid of that mm. that feeling. Yeah, yeah. Like it's interesting because I remember when I was at school, lots of us did drama because that was where all the trips were, <laughs> and like I know that um. At TC, they do the the trip to. They've done a few trips to like NASA and stuff like that. Cool. Is that? Oh, you you don't. <laughs> you don't <laughs> I haven't been on those. You haven't been on that trip yet. No. So hopefully, let's get you to NASA and let's get you to Rainbow <laughs> Six Butterfly Creek. <laughs> Butterfly Creek. Let's just start our own our own trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like if if we were just to speak to one experience that we were both a part of, that kind of links to what you were saying about weaving things together or to maybe taking a class that was seen as sort of not going to achieve much. Um, we took one of the NCA Level 1 math classes on a trip to the art gallery. And so, I mean, like, that's not necessarily seen as something that links together. Um, but we had been teaching for for a while an internal based on right angle triangles and on, you know, seeing patterns and seeing, seeing how, sh- like, different shapes relate. And so when we went to the art gallery, we were actually looking at some patterns to do with um, ngatu and with tapa class. And, we you know, we'd ask some questions, you know, can you notice here, um, like, how the shapes are holding the space? And, and quite a few of um, the artist's paintings, it was Robin White's paintings, is that she speaks to a lot of the diagonals that she uses to hold the different pieces together in mm. one art piece. And so then they were getting excited and going around like, there's a right angle triangle. Oh, I can see it. And, you know, just finding these things. And so they were, I think before, maybe they hadn't linked that kind of stuff to math. And so that I, seeing them in a space where they were sort of getting in like joy from finding stuff and going like almost treating it like a, like a hunting game Mm -hmm. was really cool. Um, And then coming back, one of them linked it themselves. We didn't even know till afterwards he linked it to his English where he had to do a speech and he did a speech on his experiences mm. um, I didn't know going that. through the gallery. Yeah. So so there was stuff that we didn't know <laughs> was happening, but that one effort to sort of just take it outside of maths a little bit seemed to have some ripple effects that we weren't so aware of um, that were cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I suppose that really speaks to the same point that I was saying before where it's like if you can – just give a meaningful experience or something, even just like a problem mm. to chew mm. on, um, then it'll stick in the student's mind and then and then you get to see what they end up doing with that kind of yeah. in ways that you don't really expect. Yeah. And yeah, like there's a bit of a like a stick in a carrot thing. Like the stick approach is kind of to be like, hey, you should take the subject so that um you know, you can have these opportunities and stuff like that. And that's fair enough. And that works for a number of different students. But then at the same time, there's the Mm. carrot approach, which is just draw them along bit by bit, showing them interesting things. And then boom, before they know it, they're in your calculus class. (laughs) Nice. uh, Yeah, you drag them kicking and screaming into the... Into your calculus yeah, class, yeah. <laughs> just because you interested them and bought them some pizza sometimes, and cool. So we'll, we'll buy some people some pizzas. <laughs> so come along to this teaching thing, and as soon as we get them to summer intensive, they'll be sold. <laughs> just have them sign their souls away. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, we had a joke for a little bit about um your first child. Mm. You, know, you have to give us your first child My to first be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. We're coming to a part in our um, 
in our episode or what we like to do here is um what we call this or that mm. um where we give you two options and you pick one um so i'll go uh, either of you can answer both of you should answer mm. Um, but let's let's see how we go anyway. <clears throat> so I'll give you two examples of of things. You know, it might be uh, Gatorade or water. Um, mm, and okay. if you're Bobby Boucher, you'll say water every time. Um, Gatorade is better. Where oh, are we even uh, <laughs> like? I'm looking at my producer. Like, are we uh, are we even allowed to say brands? All right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, shout out to Gatorade. Give us a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Blue Apron. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Um, library duty or field duty? Oh, field duty. Field duty. Yeah. 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 Why field duty? The library is just boring. Want to be on the field? <laughs> well, nice, nice. In the, in the sun. sun. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, windows open or crank the AC? What country? I think we're like we're like assuming you guys have got AC and stuff like that too. Here in the middle of summer. Here in the middle of summer. Do you have AC? That's nice, man. In my high school, I don't even have windows, AC. man. We don't have windows. <laughs> no, <laughs> calculus <laughs> used to be the it's the calculator. bullshit. No, nah, no nah, windows, windows, windows. Yeah, no, nice. I'll go with windows. I'll Coffee or Coca Cola? Neither. Neither. Nice. Coffee. What's the option? Tea. <laughs> tea. Tea. Nice. Sandwich or pie? Sandwich. Pie. Sandwich. That's controversial. What sandwich. Kind of sandwich. Yeah. What kind of sandwich are you going for? Tuna sandwich. Tuna sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong choice, Rice. I do. Hang on. What, the wrong what kind of pie? What kind of pie? I don't know. <laughs> you guys have had the tuna sandwiches that I've had. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Auntie Wan. She makes the best tuna sandwich. Okay, sweet. We have to. <laughs> you get one, one of those day. to try it. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have to do a, a show a show down like a here's the tuna sandwich rista. What kind of pie from where? Oh, pepper steak from the BP. Oh, that sounds pretty good. That does actually, sound pretty good. like gas station pies are, are actually leveling quite up. Quality. Um, year thirteen versus staff at sports. Do you have the youth year thirteen games versus the staff? So, are we saying who we think would win? Yeah. Um. Mm. I'm on the staff team, so it's got to be the staff. Nice. <laughs> I don't know about our staff, man. <laughs> Is this rugby? What are they playing? Full contact. Uh, rugby. Nah, the year 13 will win. <laughs> Long balls, yeah. Long balls could be different. Yeah, yeah, it? maybe staff. Okay. Um, school trips or professional development? School trips. Professional development, yeah, because oh. I like to, I'd like something new. <laughs> <laughs> nice, you like to learn new things. Yeah, you don't think you want to learn on a school trip? Huh? Oh, be. I like the other thing about school trips though is like I would have anxiety about taking my young people out. Are mm. we running the school trip or we're going? You're yeah, running the school trip. <laughs> no, not as a Do you think you're going on the school trip as a student? <laughs> you can't go backwards. Sorry, you so, want to go to <laughs> You gotta, you gotta look after a hundred students. You wanna learn calculus? <laughs> <What trip? laughs> oh, okay. Now, nah, still school trips. School I, trips. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Is that is that a struggle? I only assume it's a struggle looking after. Like I, yeah. Again, I can with really relate to With a team, no, I think you set yourself up for success. Yeah. You go with a team. You make sure there's enough people. Yeah, definitely school trips. Nice. In Rams forms. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Cool. This next section is called All Good or Not Good. Mm. It's like we just could be like um, Fuzzy as the All Blacks coach. All good, not good. We're in a new era now. Let's not let's not go backwards. Um, teaching, team teaching. All good, not good. All good. All good? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um. Friday drinks in the staff room. All good, not good. All good. All good. Drinks of water. Drinks of water. Drink. I know you don't drink, but like as a, as like a practice, do you think it's all good to kind of like drink on on oh, on, on campus and things like that? Mm. Oh. Wow, principles being checked. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the teaching council. <laughs> <laughs> not good. <laughs> not good. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> that's an interesting one, though, right? Yeah, like, yeah. it's also one like as a dad now, 
like I check myself whenever there's drinking around my kids and stuff like that. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to keep them around those yeah. kind of spaces and like. Yeah, in the school space, that's an interesting one, eh? What you wonder what impact that has? Because on the one hand, like. Yeah, you do have students who like to stay around school and at the same time you want to keep like a bit of separation of space. Mm. Mm. But then on the other hand, it's quite difficult to get staff all together and then like have a place where you can just sort of share and make those bonds. Mm. So, yeah, I guess that's just the pros and the yeah. cons. Give and take, give and take. But for now, it's all good, see? All good. Thank you. <laughs> um. Teachers jumping the queue at the tuck shop. You know, it's a it's a busy day. You've had duty all day, had nothing to eat, you need to get to class. Is it okay to kind of just say, please, Oos, can I just jump in here? And not that you'd ever call your students Oos, but you know, like, can I just jump in and quickly buy me a, a sandwich? You know, a sandwich? Mm. All good's not good. Not, not good. Maybe they just have a back door. <laughs> Maybe there's somewhere else where they can buy from. Oh, like a special like touch shop for only for teachers where they get nicer stuff than the students. <laughs> That's what no. you're suggesting. No. no? Lower well, prices. They, free stuff for the teachers. The and... And... <laughs> no, I think not good. Not good. Not good. Yeah, I think it's just a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, oh, I mean, not good. <laughs> it's not like you would ever really do it, do we? Yeah. Do you order from the touch shop at school and stuff like Never that? Is that something them. you're allowed to do? Uh, we get the free lunches though. Do you guys have free lunches? Yes, but just for the students. Oh, true. Yeah, yeah. Do you, <laughs> sometimes there's some leftover <laughs> in the teaching council. I always pick my own lunch. <laughs> lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, teachers wearing jandals. Not just all good. The best. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. That's the best option. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best in any option, really. Oh man, yeah i I have actually never worn it while teaching. Yeah, but I do think jandals is such a good option. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're you, great to wear. Have you ever <laughs> like? Have you ever gone to school in some like questionable, uh, like attire? Have you ever like been showed up to school in the morning and be like, maybe I should maybe have never worn my stubbies and my in my in my singlet today. I think mine was just about length and been like, oh, maybe that's just a bit too short or okay. just a bit too. Yeah, I think. Or maybe that's way too colorful. Like I'm like like too bright for myself. Like, oh yeah. Standing up there. Yeah, stuff like that. What about you, Sunny? Oh, just the gendals. Yeah. Um, yeah, my students have recently started asking me when I'm wearing normal shoes. So where are your math shoes? <laughs> <laughs> so I just. Pop, pop yeah, yeah with the, the shoes, calculus shoes and get barefoot and then I teach so much better <laughs> nice um I wanted to kind of um chat to you guys about you know there's been uh some things in the media um uh, like when people are watching this it'll be next last year um but for us now mm. it's a little bit recently around the PISA tests and things like that mm. um with it's a, a primary school test I think that they do on maths and things like that and um, uh, you know, it kind of shows a decline in the, in the math levels and things like that. Um, but I think it like I don't know from like when I and of course it's great to talk to you guys because you're on the ground, um, teaching maybe the year nines as they come through and things like that. Like, is it something that you've noticed in your schools? Like over a short, I know you've not been there for long, but uh, is there a, a massive level drop uh, from your year thirteens to your year nines? Mm, interesting. So the difference between those that have the yeah, I'm just now like, compared to I think a couple of years. You back. know, there's some data that shows us that, and I don't know whether it's right or wrong. You know, I think I wonder if it's taken into account things like COVID and mm. not being in schools and things like that. But is do you have you noticed the considerable drop in the ability of our young people in maths? Yeah, I'm, I mean, for myself, I don't know if. I've been in teaching long enough to be able to make a fair judgment, but I would say like compared to where like I thought they would be at or compared to maybe what was somewhat common knowledge when I was at high school, um, definitely like, yeah, have I've, I have been in mathematics while we were teaching at Otahu, really surprised with where some, were, some of the students were at when they entered high school. Mm. And just been like, oh, wow, like, you know, like this is possible. Like we've 
how did this happen kind of thing. Um, but not, I haven't been in long enough to be able to judge, I feel, for myself. Yeah, mm. yeah I think similar. Like, it's hard to tell if there's been a drop from the year 13s to year 9s because the year 13s that I end up getting are the ones who have been quite successful at school. And at the same time, I didn't actually get to see them when they were year 9. Mm. But overall, I would echo that same sentiment that, um, yeah, it's just a bit surprising about how how much there is missing there. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's just an adjustment that we have to make mm. because you work with what you have. But yeah, there are just certain assumptions mm. that we have that by the time a student is year nine, they'd probably know this. And then it's just often not the case. Yeah. Um, are, yeah. You fi- are you finding it like they're, catching on quite quickly and, and things like that or like are you starting to I guess you're still learning how to develop those skills and things like that eh? well um because I think it was either 2018 or 2019 there was like this Royal Society report about um the state of math teaching in New Zealand and I think that's where the PISA stuff comes from mm. but yeah they they made like a bunch of observations and they made a bunch of recommendations and then part of that was them noticing that because schools are like under resourced, that everyone just comes up with their own resources in a sort of ad hoc manner. And then because of that, we end up having students who fall through the cracks because we're just doing things one step at a time rather than sort of weaving a net that can catch all of the students. Mm. Um, and so to that point, it's what I, I would say is that. In terms of background knowledge, a lot of our students are lacking foundation. Mm. But in terms of their actual intelligence, yeah. when you have the time to sit down with them, they can readily fill those gaps quite quickly. Yeah. Mm. And the challenge of teaching is just how do you do that when you've got 30 students in front of you and you don't know where the gaps are yet and they mm. all have different gaps yeah. and they don't, you don't have the time to sit down with them one-on-one. Yeah. which is why there really needs to be like a set of resources at each level just so that you can catch each student and so they're still engaged mm. in something while you're sitting down and talking and working out misconceptions with another one. Yeah, I mean, something that we've talked about <clears throat> when we were teaching in the same space was about being really clear on the fundamentals and like most often it'll be the year 13, year 12, year 11 teachers that know the fundamentals but they're not necessarily teaching Um, the junior classes and so you know they'll get these students and not be aware of like where they're at at all Um, and so at one point we're like you know being really clear if like if there is a way to be able to create so that these resources that everyone's um, looking at developing actually contribute to a student themselves being able to assess you know almost individually have I ticked off that first step of understanding Mm -hmm. before going to the next one because as soon as they jump in the next class if they haven't done you know, their times tables or whatnot, they're going to find it really hard and then they'll fall through the crack again and then next class still fall. And not, you know, particularly know that I oh, actually it was just because I've, I have still haven't done this one step right yeah. at the beginning um, that these guys would have never known anyway. And so being able to really, like, have some of those resources available um, and, and for teachers to be really aware of that pathway and almost, almost give it to to the student to be like, okay, where am I at? Am I learning? What's the next thing that I need to learn? Is something that yeah. I know we were curious about when we were looking at resource development. That's interesting because I feel like quite often we saddle our kids with the responsibility of them not achieving um, when actually it's the things that, that are in and around them that are mm. not really serving serving them, I guess. Mm. And so it's interesting to hear how do we bring that back in a different way, right? How do we help them to be responsible for their learning um, and understand kind of where they're at and things like that. I appreciate that. Maybe that should have been one of our this or that's, but um, um, like, you know, I, I've noticed also with my daughter at school, like the focus has kind of turned to like mental math, mm. um, where like in my day it was very much rote, kind of rote style learning. So um, like, which one do you think is, you know, do you have to learn all of your times tables um, for that right rote learning stuff, or do you do you think we should lean more into the the mental math kind of way of doing it? 
Does it make sense? Yeah. Which one I, would you pick? Can Both. I, <laughs> can I ask a question? Yeah. Like, from so then from your perspective, mm. like as a father, yeah. Then yeah, what do you see? Do you see that it's working or not working? Or but it blows my mind. She blows my mind every day with how much she knows. And like how much better she is at maths than I was when I was a kid, and but like also like sometimes I think we do that thing of where we put it down to oh she's just naturally good at this thing, mm. where actually there has been some scaffolding for her to understand maths in a different way that I learned it because learning what seven times eight was is still I still don't know what that is and it's still really hard for me because I couldn't mentally uh, I couldn't remember that I couldn't do the right root style thing so. Mm-hmm. I think it's better to do the mental stuff, but you know, also I did the root style and then didn't go through calculus in the end. So maybe I'm not the the key candidate, but for that, but yeah. I mean, what I'm particularly curious about with education is is supporting young people to be thinkers, right, and to you know to learn how to think, to learn how to put a set of things in front of you, and then to be able to observe them really clearly, understand their relationship, and then you know, see what influence they have on each other and how you can use them. And so with maths especially, sometimes to be able to make an observation Mm. or to see patterns, you need certain tools. And that's where some Mm. of the fundamental skills of rote learning comes in play. Like, And it doesn't necessarily mean that all of it has to be like, hey, learn this, 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 this. But sometimes um, to recognize patterns and to, um, yeah, see certain relationships, you actually have to almost memorize them. Otherwise, when you get it put in front of you, yeah. you might, might not see it. Um, mm. And that was something that I think, you know, especially with like algebra or different things where you have to memorize different sets of equations, mm. you can see it as soon as it's put in front of yeah. you again because someone's already done the huge uh, background yeah. learning. They've already figured out that relationship. Mm. So maybe if there's like a way to balance it where it's like you have all these tools that someone's already developed for you, you can use them but play with them like here they are and now you know put them in front of you and see if there's a way that you can you can think with them and not that be the The end that's a means and then at the end really is like can we can we provide a space where they're using that those tools to think Mm. and then what are the scaffolding steps for them to be able to think with those tools and to introduce them in small steps i think is Yeah. yeah what we're looking at no there's a perfect explanation if i can just slap a metaphor on your explanation it's kind of like um, someone could have a very good natural ear for music, mm. but if they've not been mm. exposed to the different types, then they don't know how to identify it. And there's a right way to do rote learning and a wrong way to do rote learning. Yeah. And I think the wrong way is if it just ends with rote learning. Mm. But if it's, as you're saying, with a purpose towards identifying something in patterns, then it makes a bit more sense. Mm. It's like if we're if we're working on colouring, then... Yeah. I still can't do this either. Yeah. Coloring within the lines. <laughs> yeah. But then it's like, okay, so we need to practice coloring in the, in the lines. And so then you just drill just coloring inside the lines without any consideration as to like any kind of artistic artistic choices or anything like yeah. that. It's like, y- yes, we're coloring inside the lines, but it's for the purpose of, so this yeah. whole thing actually looks a bit nicer. But if you just berate a student for not being able to color inside the lines, yeah, and, you know that's why I didn't take art. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Me, cool. Um, one of the things we like to reflect on is um, like some nostalgia from your from your kids' days, or for, from your days as as a kid. Um, mm. I remember my school days. Um, one of my favorite things to do um was to go to the TV lounge because I was a border in my school. Um, and watch um. I watch um, Dragon Ball Z. So, like, what was your, like, go-to, like, cartoon after school? Oh, wow. (laughs) It's going to be revealing. (laughs) I'm trying to remember because, believe it or not, we didn't have a TV at home. Oh, yeah. And so it was more like, what did we go watch at my friend's house? (laughs) I got the opportunity to go visit. Um, Oh, what was it? I think... So the Filipino oh. DVDs. <laughs> God, those were definitely playing when I was in school. I think Avatar was the coolest. Oh, like yep. the last event. I remember that playing. I think we got like Sky TV at Tonga at one point come in and there was like a series of Nickelodeon channels and it was like the most like impressive thing. Um, nice. Yeah, That's so a good one. I think Avatar, Avatar man. Avatar. So many lessons learned from that TV program. So much wisdom. Aguero. 
<laughs> so much the wisdom. Good, good father figure. Hundred percent. Yu Gi Oh. Yu Gi Oh. All the all the your types. move. <laughs> nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man. You gotta just, trust. You gotta trust in the heart of the cards. Exactly. It's just something wow, about you, really you know that moves you in here, right? How many shows did you hey, watch? Man. <laughs> hey man, every single one. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh was a good my, one. My brother once said, like, you know, probably seventy percent of my personality comes from anime. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's like a really like decent, respectable and guy with a lot of integrity. Yeah. But he, it just all comes from anime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so true. <laughs> I'm kind of keen to see. Like, do you have that in the classroom? Like your your fun son who's self outside and then you get into the classroom and the fairy takes over. <laughs> <laughs> and when I take when I take the shoes off and put the jandals on. Yeah. It's young it's son. Time. <laughs> it's time to teach. <laughs> now I play calculus. <laughs> that, that's how we're reading the place. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I see you you're gonna it. take me to Rainbow Zen. I play. <laughs> play I play Green. resignation. <laughs> resignation. Wow, he's deep. Um. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, so like the next, I guess we're looking to see what's on the on the cards next for you guys. Like what's on the cards? Yeah, we're well, still like <laughs> we're still playing <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh. <Dark Yu-Gi-Oh. laughs> um, I mean, like you've moved to TC and things like that. Um. Like, how, where do you kind of see yourself moving in the next kind of five years? Mm. Going to take it back to Tonga and Vavau. Um, beautiful over the eye here. Yeah, it is beautiful. I think I think there is a real, like I do have a real sense of responsibility to do something that links back to the islands because I think they have things that really complement each other, you know, being able to link back to the land where a lot of um, – the culture and the values that the students have has grown, you know, in those areas. And so especially when I think of, you know, TC has a massive Tongan community and a lot of their values and cultures has grown from the land in Tonga and the islands there. And so being able to make that link and also the schools in Tongan, you know, being able to link back to the curriculum and the resources that are being developed here, you know, is there a way to, mm. to, to weave those together? Is there a way to give that sort of natural experience and engagement and, um, community, a sense of community, a sense of you know being on the land that that we can give exposure to the students here in the islands is something that I'm particularly curious about. Um, I think though, probably like see myself in the next few years is like I would hope that you know got into a stage in my in my teaching where a student that I'm like working with, I can see a real clear pathway in terms of how. They are, they're being accompanied in their learning journey and, and being like, okay, yeah, although they're in this class with me for 45 minutes mm-hmm. or an hour with um, myself alongside with the teachers and, you know, SLT or whatever, we're clear on the pathway of that student so that what I'm teaching them now is part of a bigger vision. Mm-hmm. Like I think that's kind of some, some of my bigger goals is like being really aware of what it looks like and contributing to what that pathway looks like so that there is education doesn't just end or doesn't just mm. tick boxes, mm. but it's like, oh yeah, our education is for excellence, but it's also for development. So it's something that's being taken back into their communities and linking to stuff that they actually value. Um, nice. Yeah, I'm curious about, yeah. Hey, what about you? So, <laughs> this one's here. <laughs> it's not a competition, but <laughs> the stage is yours. <laughs> what cards do you no, play? Just, <laughs> just thinking about how to one up you. <laughs> so, I'm going to move to some. <laughs> wow, nice. uh, um, yeah, so I'm making a move to a, a new school. Mm. So, that should be interesting. But I think mm. a similar sort of vision which is i think why we were so successful in collaborating together Mm. it's basically the idea that yeah hoping that if i'm teaching math that that math teaching is playing into something bigger Mm. and if i'm teaching math then trusting that if i'm away that the education will still go on yeah like Mm. yeah and i think it takes a long time to set something up to even get to that point um and even to understand it yourself as a teacher and so as a teacher, I guess that's what my goal would be. But as a human, like, I'm a young man with a lot of will to live. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah. I don't know, maybe I'll go to Korea and pick apples for a year or something. <laughs> you never know. 
Nice. But yeah. Get <laughs> apple picking in, <laughs> in Korea. Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> and we all come along. <laughs> did, nice. I a, did I beat that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Played that wild card. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, this is the Lesson Learned podcast. And I guess like we we like to kind of um, close our, our episodes out with kind of a message for you, for our young people. Um, and we, we, how we frame this sometimes is around kind of like might be a, a message for yourself, kind of 14 year old, you sneaking over to your neighbors to watch Avatar, um, <laughs> or play Yu Gi Oh at your local, um, shop. I don't know if you did that, but I play cards sometimes. It's fun. What do you, <laughs> what's the message? <laughs> my message, my <laughs> younger self is so capable. You're allowed to play Magic the Gathering with your friends. Um, or you're not allowed. Oh, no, nah, it's just, wasn't really cool sometimes. <laughs> oh, because it wasn't you know? cool. It was, <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> I just wanted it to be cool. Oh. Um, it's, it's cool now. It's 30 years. There's been, this is a good, sorry, that's another. Another thing, but yeah, <laughs> what's the message? <laughs> That's a really poor message. We've thought out from me, just like playing <laughs> what's the Magic the Gathering. Yeah, what would be something for young people to kind of? What's a, an important thing that you think for them to hear at this point? Learning is really fun, like, and mm. yeah, the more you can find your way into learning, I truly think the more fun you'll have and like the more diversity of experiences you get to have as well. Mm. And so I find it a real shame when people or students are quite focused on having fun now. And then that just guarantees that they're going to be bored for the next 10 years or something because they haven't found something that has real depth to it. Mm. And so I guess the advice would just be, um, yeah, just find something, anything, learn it well, learn it deeply, and then you have a good time. And then you'll find someone who values that, gives you some money for it. But just find something and learn it deeply. Nice. Cool. Yeah. I think something similar. It's like maybe the statement would be something along the lines of like always – like feel free to question what something's purpose is. And as you question and you discover and you come across challenges, know that there are other people asking too. And so check in with them and, and do it with them, explore with them um, and learn with them. Because I think, yeah, there's there's heaps to discover when you question something's purpose and something's youths and something's potential. Um, yeah, there's lots to discover. Nice. Awesome. And with that, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, yeah, it's been really great to catch up with you and looking forward to um, all of the great things kind of to come and best of luck with your new school. Um, best of luck with your plans to bring those things closer with Tonga. Thank you, guys. Thank Have you, time, you, Now, all good. Sweet. Mm-hmm.